Thank you everyone for coming out today. I'm here to introduce a man who needs little introduction. He was co-founder at PayPal, face, one of the first investors at Facebook, chairman of Palantir, and billionaire investor, Peter Thiel. Great, thank, thank you very much. It's a tremendous privilege to be here. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to do a, a little bit of a redux on uh, some of the debates I was involved in as an undergraduate law student, late 80s, early 90s, sort of like this distant past and somehow um, feels like it still has, you know, a great deal of resonance for some of the things going on today. I got caught up in a lot of the culture wars, the campus wars, started a conservative uh, student newspaper, Stanford Review, which is you know, still going after 35 years. Um, and you know, there were sort of all these, there were all these debates we got caught up in. Uh, that, you know, it, was, it was always hard to know, you know, was it campus hijinks? Was it just some you know, silly clown show? Or you know, were they actually, but then some of these things seem to be more cosmic, more important. There was a you know, signature debate at Stanford in the late 1980s over the uh, Western culture uh, core freshman curriculum. There was, you know, the sort of protests, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western culture's got to go. It then sort of got replaced, you know, with, uh, with a new curriculum. In some ways, this was a debate about one class, but then on, on another level, it was a debate about um, the entire uh, Western civilization and what was at stake. Um, and, uh, you know, a um, friend and I sort of put, uh, did, wrote one of these uh, anti-political correctness books, uh, uh, the Diversity Myth, published in 1995, almost 30 years ago, and I thought I would, I would start with a short reading from, from the book to sort of set the tone of, um, you, know, uh, you know, in a way how, how we're still on this Groundhog Day. But, uh, so one, one of the books that it was about the new class, one of the books that uh, replaced Shakespeare's The Tempest was a book by uh, M.A. Césaire called A Tempest, which was sort of a revolutionary political deconstruction of The Tempest, where uh, Prospero is the evil colonialist, and Caliban, um, who's sort of the monster in The Tempest, becomes the revolutionary hero. And it sort of culminates in a final indignant tirade. And I will read you the, tir the tirade of um, Aimé Césaire's Caliban. <clears throat> Understand what I say, Prospero. For years I bowed, bowed my head, for years I took it, all of it. Your insults, your ingratitude, and worst of all, more degrading than all the rest, your condescension. But now it's over, over, do you hear? Of course at the moment you're still stronger than I am, but I don't give a damn for your power or for your dogs or your police or your inventions. And do you know why? It's because I know I'll get you. Um, you know, and you lied to me so much about the world, about yourself, that you ended up by imposing on me an image of myself, underdeveloped in your words, incompetent, that's how you made me see myself. Um, and I loathe that image and its faults, and I know that one day my bare fist, just that, will be enough to crush your world. The old world is falling apart. And by the way, you have a chance to get it over with. You can fuck off. You can go back to Europe, but in a pig's eye you will. I'm sure you won't leave. You make me laugh with your mission, your vocation. Your vocation is to give me shit. And that's why you'll stay just like those guys who founded the colonies and who can't now live anywhere else. You're just an old colonial addict. That's what you are. At any rate, we sort of um, went on like this for about 250 pages in, the, in this book, and sort of the, 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 the uh, pretense we had was that you know, we're, the, the way you change these debates is you somehow speak truth to power. You know, on some level, these were just debates about Stanford, but then um, you know, the, the sort of the wrapper we put on the book was that uh, ideas have consequences, that what happens at these colleges will gradually translate um, outside of that context into uh, all sorts of other places and that they will seep into the, the broader world beyond. And, uh, and of, cor of course, you know, there's sort of a way in which I'm, I shouldn't probably gratify, it's the wrong word, but I feel like, you know, for many, for about maybe 20 years, I felt that I'd spent too much time writing this book. Um, the last decade, I feel a lot better about it. It feels incredibly prophetic. Um, but of course, it's the sort of thing where you'd rather be wrong than prophetic in some ways. Um, and when I go through the, the arguments of the diversity myth, it's still all the particulars, I think, that we were basically right. Very little I would change on the particulars. 
Um, and so we're right, not wrong, but there are some ways in which we were not even wrong. And this is kind of the, the, the retrospective I want to give. Because um, if, you, if you lose a debate like this for 30 years, um, you should ask yourself, what were you missing? What did you get, what did you get wrong? Where, or where were you not even wrong? Where did you sort of miss the whole boat? Um, and uh, I, I'm going to sort of go through three, three major areas that I think uh, we, we missed. But uh, maybe one, one other way to, to set this up a little bit is that one, one piece of the, the book that I think held up quite well was the title, the, the Diversity Myth. And it's an ambiguous title. It can mean two different things. You can put the stress on the word diversity, which is the normal thing. And then there's sort of a conservative critique, which is, um, you know, you don't have um, real, you don't have diversity when you don't have diversity of ideas, or it's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's um, you know, diversity, um, it's not enough to have diversity to hire the extras from the space cantina scene in Star Wars, or something like this. And there's sort of a whole list of things like that. But the, the other, perhaps deeper critique is to put the stress on the word myth, that, um, you know, we don't actually know what diversity means. It's, it's generally left undefined. It's just sort of a shibboleth. It's a false god. Um, and it somehow is very important um, to leave it relatively undefined. And, uh, and, and then the way it functions is as a kind of um, attention narrowing. Our attention gets narrowed on these particular debates. Or it's like, a, you think of it as a magic show where the magician is performing these diversity tricks on stage, but you ignore the uh, man in the orange monkey suit jumping up and down on the back of the stage or, or something like this. So it's a sort of an attention redirection and incredible narrowing. And, uh, and so when, when one has a critique of this, there's sort of always these, there's this tension between saying that it's somehow uh, very, um, very evil and very silly. And uh, the way I would resolve that tension is it's very silly on the level of these particular things like, you know, the sort of uh, book I was just describing. And it's, but it's maybe very evil in that it's um, distracting us from various other things. There's sort of three things I want to suggest are, would have been more important things for us to focus on. You know, one is sort of broadly economics. Second one is, let's say, science and technology. Third is uh, even bigger questions of religion and Christianity. So let me take them one at a time. This is sort of going to be a super fast, uh, uh, Articulation, maybe too many ideas, but uh, you know, on the uh, on the economic question, one one would say that uh, that this that uh, you know, and th this would be sort of a libertarian or even a Marxist critique of cultural Marxism diversity is that when you divide people by you know race and gender, you forget about class, you forget about the economy. And there is something, there is something very curious that, you know, in the, in the many decades that uh, the diversity took off um, from the 1970s onwards, and you have to think this is like a 50 year or so process, um, it also correlated with um, the economy going sideways, inequality going up massively in all these ways, and, uh, and you, have to, you have to at least start to ask some of these, you know, correlation causation questions. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that diversity caused the inequality, but if, if, if these two things happen at the same time, uh, one should at least uh, ask this sort of a, this sort of a question. And, uh, you know, and then there, there's sort of all these versions we could ask about, you know, the woke corporation or something like this. Is the woke corporation, is that a form of, you know, mass insanity? Or is it a, um, is it a clever plot to, you know, pay the workers less and the shareholders more? Or, you know, so is it some, some combination of a racket and useful idiots, or something like this. Or this would be, you know, if you had, uh, I don't know, a, a Marxist like Rosa Luxemburg here, and uh, we asked her to talk about diversity. You know, what she would tell you is there can be no class that's more revolutionary than the proletariat. Anyone who's not, you know, um, a, a worker is a part of the reactionary class. And so a, a diversity officer at, at Harvard University is in the same class as a bank robber or a prostitute. They're part of a corrupt capitalist racket. They're not, you know, they're, they're actually retarding the sort of necessary economic analysis that we need to do. Um, the, the, the economic dimension that I always think is very underrated, sort of as a halfway between libertarian and Marxism, 
is uh, George, the Georgist theory. Which he, uh, Henry George was this late 19th century economist. He was considered to be sort of quasi-socialist in the late 19th century, sort of semi-libertarian today, which I don't think reflects any ways that he changed, but more reflection of how our society changed. Um, and the basic Georgist analysis was you have to always look at um, real estate as an incredibly important dimension of the, the economy and what's going on in real estate. And if you're not careful, um, you end up with sort of runaway real estate prices in which um, all the value, all the growth gets captured by the landlords at the expense of everybody else. And, uh, and there's sort of, uh, there are ways we can think of um, the last 50, 60 years as a kind of Georgist catastrophe in you know, the US, sort of much of the, probably all the Anglosphere countries, many, many adjacent countries. And uh, you can sort of go through the math in different ways where you know, it's, it's something like you know, a, a place like London or San Francisco or New York where maybe the uh, inelasticity of real estate is something like minus two, which means that if you increase the supply by 1%, the average price goes down 2%, and that means that the more housing you build, the less it is collectively worth. And when you get effects like that, very weird things start to happen. You get sort of crazy nimbyism, crazy um, restrictions on growth, but uh, basically a massive, massive wealth transfer from the people who rent to, uh, to the uh, urban slumlords. And something like this it was, is what, what has happened at scale. And then, the, and then the question is, why is this not analyzed? Why is it, you know, probably by, by some measures, um, that I've seen, you can explain 100% of the increase in inequality in the last five decades to real estate alone. And it's just, do you own, do you rent? Didn't matter in 1970. It matters a great deal today. And that basically is, is sort of a way to think of this entire arrangement. And it's sort of a curious thing that we can't talk about it. And then, and then you have these questions, you know, how does this relate to these diversity debates? Where are the distractions from this or, or something like this? But if I would, were to anchor on, on a place like New York or, or San Francisco, if, I, I'd, if we were sitting there in 2007 at the peak of the, of the ridiculous housing bubble of the Bush years, and you told me, you know, in, in 17 years, um, the rents will be double in Manhattan or San Francisco what they are today. I would have said, this is just completely impossible. I would say people would move. They'd, they'd go somewhere else. And you said, well, it happened. Just tell me, what, what's sort of the Occam's razor thing that would have had to happen for the rents to double in these places, for people not to do the common sense thing and just move. And it would be something like, well, I don't know, they must have been really brainwashed in some crazy, crazy ideology. And uh, there must have been some kind of a Stockholm, some kind of a Stockholm syndrome in which uh, um, you couldn't imagine doing something else. And there sort of are all these variations of the story I can tell. So if you're, if you're a gay person, uh, you were told that um, you couldn't move out of Manhattan. If you move to Hoboken, New Jersey, as soon as you move there, you get beaten up. So you have to stay in Manhattan. Or you're you know, a, uh, a woman living in a rat-infested apartment in San Francisco, and you have these fantasies about moving to a nice suburban house in Reno, Nevada. And you are told, um, no, as soon as you do that, you'll be chained to your bed and forced to carry a baby to term. And so you have to stay in your rat-infested apartment. And again, you know, I, I want to be very careful not to put, make this too conspiratorial. So you know, correlation does not prove causation. But when you have trillions of dollars of value that gets transferred, isn't it odd that we cannot even ask this question? And that we can't even ask, you know, um, was it a conspiracy or an as-if conspiracy of, of the urban slumlords or were there people who sort of went on this uh, diversity racket as, as part of the transfer? And then, of course, there is a, uh, there's a university ver dimension to this whole crisis, where if you look at a place like um, um, Harvard and Cambridge or something like this, um, there is sort of a question about how, um, how to analyze this in terms of the faculty, the, the people who are part of these communities. There was a, you know, I did a version of this, I always think the UK is an even more, pure, more extreme version, but there was a news item at Oxford where I did a version of these remarks a few months ago, and it was basically that uh, you could buy J.R.R. Tolkien's old house for four and a half million pounds. And uh, what, I, what I submitted to the audience was that if a faculty member at Oxford moved into Tolkien's house, uh, he or she should be investigated, right? It's, it's not possible. And, uh, and, so, and so when we ask these questions, you know, why are the faculty being radicalized in, in all these places and sort of proletarianized or turned into the sub-proletariat or whatever you want to call it, um, it is, uh, is, is it just simply this as an explanation and then, and then so something like this is 
going on needs to be thought of, and to the extent we've been distracted from asking these very basic questions, um, th this is surely a, a both a silly and very wicked thing. Um, if we, um, and then of course, uh, there is sort of a second category of distractions that are, um, that are perhaps you know, in some ways even um, bigger, that you know, I've in some ways been talking about for um, close to two decades at this point, and it is sort of this question about, um, and again, the diversity myth when we wrote this was sort of centered on the humanities. It was sort of transparently obvious this stuff was silly. And the thing we didn't talk about was the sciences, which was, um, or, or, you know, uh, which was, of course, the way the university would describe itself to the donors. It, it, you know, the university, Harvard, Stanford, they don't talk about, you know, they don't talk about all the diversity nonsense when they talk to billionaire donors to give them money. They say, you know, we're, our medical school is making all this progress, or we are really serious in physics and science, and this is, you know, this, we're at the cutting edge of these things. And, uh, and I've started to wonder, well, you know, what is actually the truth of this sort of accelerating tech, accelerating science story? How much is actually going on? How can we even measure it? Are we still progressing in tech and science? How fast are we progressing? And uh, I, I'm always willing to concede that there's been a narrow cone of progress in the world of, of bits, computers, internet, mobile internet, you know, maybe, maybe now AI, but that in the world of atoms, things have been pretty much stuck since the 1970s, and this is, this is reflected in, you know, it, even when I was an undergraduate, late 80s, you were not supposed to major in, you know, it, it, any sort of engineering major turned out to be bad, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, aeroastro, I mean, people already knew nuclear engineering was a really bad idea. And the entire world of atoms was regulated, stopped, nothing was going to happen. It, it, had, it had notably slowed down. And, uh, and then this is, uh, and then it's always, of course, a much more difficult thing to figure out what's going on in these fields. It's, they're sort of harder to get a handle on. And you have sort of these ever narrow, narrower groups of guardians guarding themselves. The string theorists tell us how great they are. The, the cancer researchers are always going to cure cancer in the next five years, and uh, it's incredible. It's much harder to evaluate than to do something like what we did with with the diversity myth. Um, uh, one of um, one of the uh, uh, one of my colleagues was in the physics PhD program at Stanford. His advisor, um, Bob Laughlin, got a Nobel Prize in physics in 1998 and, or late 90s, and um, and he suffered from the extreme delusion that uh, once he got his Nobel Prize, he had academic freedom, and that he could do whatever he wanted once he had a Nobel Prize, and he was going to investigate, and he decided he was going to investigate not things that were as controversial as, let's say, Darwinism or stem cell research or climate change, which, of course, um, but something way more dangerous than that. And he was convinced that most of the scientists were basically stealing money from the government. They were engaged in more or less fraudulent research. He started by investigating the biology department at Stanford. It uh, started with a public hearing. They didn't even bother publishing anything. It was just, we're denouncing everybody in the biology department for stealing money from the US government. And you can sort of imagine how this movie ended. You know, sort of the students had to figure out, find, find a different advisor. And uh, you, you, you couldn't do this. We, we, of course, you know, in the last 20 years, there is this thing called the replicability crisis, where all these results can't be replicated. But the people who talk about it are very careful to be politically correct and not name all the people who do it. Um, and if you started doing that, uh, it, it, would, uh, it would unravel things quite a bit more. There, and I, th I think there was this very striking illustration of this ability to focus on the humanities and not to focus on the sciences in the sort of tale of two universities, of Harvard and Stanford in the, in the last year, where both university presidents were fired. And you know, it's very understandable why Claudine got, okay, got fired. It was all the you know, fake diversity nonsense that she plagiarized. But the plagiarism was a little bit hard to tell because she was just repeating what thousands of other people had already said, so there's nothing original. But everybody else wasn't original either. I mean, if she, if she had said there was discrimination against Martians or something like that, we would have caught her much more quickly because there probably been only one person that she would have plagiarized that idea from. Um, but, um, but if we, uh, um, but then at, uh, Mark Tessier Levine at Stanford, it was basically, uh, it was this neuroscience fraud research. It's still unraveling as a story. He, would, he got fired uh, last year 
A month ago, he had to retract his most important paper on dementia. And it was, it, as far as I can tell, the entire career was a fraud. It probably, you know, I may be exaggerating, but only slightly when I say probably hundreds of millions of dollars were, were misdirected as a result of this. And somehow, the two frauds of Claudine Gay and Mark Tessiolini, they're, they're somehow complementary, and we somehow need to find a way to, um, to understand them as uh, deeply connected and, uh, and related to one another. Um, and, and probably at the margins, I think the science fraud is the, uh, is the more important and, and the bigger one to understand. You know, if, if you want a governmental analogy, it's sort of like the esotericism of the sciences should be cause for suspicion. And so if we have, uh, if, if, you, if we take, let's say, the Department of Motor Vehicles, the Post Office, and the NSA, and I ask you, what's the most corrupt, dysfunctional part of the government? My, my placeholder answer would be, it's the NSA, because nobody knows what's going on there. Um, post Office, DMV, they're transparently corrupt. Nobody does, it, does their work. And, uh, and that's sort of roughly the, the, you know, the humanities are like the post office, the, uh, the sciences are like the NSA, and, uh, and somehow we need to find a, a critique of both, or the, the debate version of this. I always think there are basically two debate techniques you can have when you go after an enemy. You can go after your enemy at the enemy's weakest point, which is the way you are most likely to score at least a tactical win. And this was sort of what we try to do in the diversity myth, all these tactical wins. But if you go with, against your enemy at the strongest, at your enemy's strongest point, and if you're able to win, it is game, set, match. And, and, and sort of my fantasy version of this, it's something like, I don't know, I don't know what the pinnacle of science is, maybe it's still string theory, and if we can show that the string theorists who are the smartest of the physicists, who are the smartest of the scientists, if we can show that the string theorists have been doing nothing for 40 years, then by some principle of transitivity, we can show that all of them are more or less corrupt, and that is sort of the game, set, match victory that, that we, need to, we need to try to achieve. Let me do a quick digression. There's always this question when I talk about the, the tech science stagnation, I think, I think it's sort of been going on since the early 1970s, is always this question, why did it take us so long to figure this stuff out? You know, why, um, you know, it's, it's sort of seeping a little bit more into the consciousness the last decade, but why could people not, uh, not figure it out? And I think there were, there were sort of two big, um, you know, the, the basic thing that you're supposed to do is figure out a way to get back to science, get back to innovation uh, that's broad-based, not just uh, narrowly in the world of bits. That's sort of broadly what you should do. But there were two one-time moves people were able to make. There was a center-right and a center-left move that sort of papered over the uh, tech stagnation in different ways. The center-right move was the Reagan-Thatcher 1980s. It was a one-time move to lower taxes, deregulate the economy, sort of get rid of a bunch of antitrust laws. And, um, and it, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I think it was the right thing for that time. You know, if you have marginal tax rates at 70%, you lower them to 28, um, and you go in a more capitalist direction, it is going to improve the economy dramatically. It is not a timeless and eternal thing. It, it worked for about seven years, 82 to 89. And then by the late 80s, early 90s, when we wrote the diversity myth, it had run out of steam. These culture wars sort of reemerged as a symptom of this. But then there was a second one-time move, which was the center-left Clinton-Blair move, which was globalization, that you could sort of do this, this one-time incredible sort of global ARB. And, and it probably came with more negative externalities than the center-right move, it, you know, and we're sort of downstream of a lot of the things that went, went haywire with this. But it got you sort of a 1995 to 2007 um, long globalization boom. It was, it was, I think it was sort of in a weird way a much harsher thing than the Reagan-Thatcher thing. It had to be dressed up in the center-left way because it, you know, the, uh, Clinton is the president where inequality went up the most. The Gini coefficient went up the most under Clinton of all the presidents since, I don't know, Truman. Um, and, and so there was, there was some kind of very severe cost to it. Um, I don't know if one should undo either globalization or, um, or, um, or capitalism, but, uh, but there is a sense in which that's, that's not, more, more of them is not where we will find the solution, and, uh, and, and we're now sort of in a place where, where these, these things need to, be, need to be rethought a lot more. Um, you know, so, so one, um, you know, one, one way to, uh, to recapitulate sort of my argument thus far is that uh, you can think of us in, as we're, we're sort of in a pit in the back of a cave, and it's a pit that is 
uh, you know, it's, there's all this artificial rainbow-colored multicultural lighting in this sort of virtual discotheque or whatever you want to call it. And, um, and something like economics, even in the Marxist or libertarian form, is um, desirable, maybe it's necessary, to at least get back to the natural cave. And then um, it's probably not sufficient to get out of that cave. And then if we, want to, if we want to move out of the cave, we have to think about some other things like the, the science, tech, tech questions, and then maybe, maybe even um, some broader questions about, uh, about religion and Christianity. Let me, let me end on, on this third, third theme. Where, um, coming back to diversity as a distraction, we're, we're sort of not able to pay attention to things. If we think of sort of something like Anselm's ontological argument, there's nothing you can conceive that's greater than God. If we can, if we can distract you from thinking about God, the biggest thing in the world, wow, that's a pretty powerful distraction machine. And uh, it's pretty extraordinary to, to the extent it's been, been pulled off. And, uh, and, uh, and yet I, I keep thinking that there's surely some kind of a Christian um, or um, uh, ver analysis of this that uh, if we sort of look uh, into the microscope or the telescope from the other side, from what I would say is the right side, um, maybe, uh, maybe um, it would be a very illuminating analysis. Um, there's, there's a lot that one can say about this, but, but, but one kind of a framing is that um, there, there's obviously sort of a very odd way that something like Christianity connects with this uh, woke religion. And, uh, you know, Christianity, um, you know, the Bible um, is the one religion that takes the side of the victims. And somehow this, this focus on victims is, um, you, know, it, it, you know, it has its origins in Judaism, Christianity. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of already in the beginning of the book of Genesis, uh, you know, we have the story of Cain and Abel. It's a contrast. You know, it's, it's similar to the myth of the founding of Rome, you know, Romulus and Remus, but the Roman myth uh, takes the point of view of the city, uh, and uh, Romulus is right, Remus is, deserves to be killed. Uh, the Bible, Cain founds the first city, Ro Romulus founds the greatest city in the ancient world. Um, the story of Cain and Abel, the Bible takes the side of Abel. And then, you know, there's sort of a way in which, you know, the normal story of, of Egypt and the Jews would be from the Egyptians. We sort of got rid of the troublemakers and sent them away. Um, and it's, it gets told from, from the other side. And then, of course, there is, there is a version where the story of Christ is, is the story in part of Christ as a, as a victim. And, uh, and, uh, and so there is sort of, there are these complicated ways where the, the woke religion, if we call it a religion, is, it's not, you know, it's not like this super weird new thing. It is maybe just one toggle switch away from Christianity or, or so, something like this. Um, there is probably a lot one could say about, you know, Judaism, Islam, Christianity. Uh, the, the, if, if we were sitting here 100 years ago in 1924, I think it would have been clear that Christianity was sort of the odd one out. It was you know, not strictly monotheistic. It was Trinitarian. It, was, uh, it basically took, um, it basically, you know, in Islam or Judaism, it was inconceivable that someone could murder God. So, uh, so there was cer certainly a, 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 a claim about how bad people were, where Christianity was more extreme. And then there was, uh, and then there was also something about it where there was a greater need for forgiveness or, or something like this. And if we, if we had to simplify these sort of culture debates massively, I, I, I keep thinking you could say, you know, there's, there's this sort of very complicated uh, Christian balance you're supposed to strike about history where history was terrible and the left is right that history was terrible. And it's sort of this tale of violence and injustice, et cetera, et cetera. But you need to find a way to forgive people and, and, uh, and move on. And you have to somehow you know, hate, hate the sin and love the sinner. You have to, and then there's some sort of version of this on, on the debates on history. And then the sort of the, the two alternatives to that are broadly something like, something like um, the, let's say, the non-Christian alt-right where it's, you know, we just shouldn't feel so guilty about the history. And uh, I, I find it very tempting personally. This is where, you know, it's like Curtis Yarvin, Bronze Age pervert, all these people. It's like, 
um, I am so sick of feeling guilty about stuff, and I would just like, I would just like to, to move on. Um, and uh, there is sort of just a question, is this actually feasible? You know, is this sort of narrative sustainable? And you know, certainly when you go into the particulars, it, it probably does break down in all sorts of ways. You know, it's, it's, it's probably, you know, you're probably not supposed to say that you know, all the slaves were happy slaves or, or things like that. That's not, you know, that, that doesn't sound like a, a winning sort of argument. But then um, the, uh, the, the, woke, um, the woke religion is sort of more on, on the other side where it is, uh, yes, there's a lot of sin, but there is no forgiveness, there's no redemption, there is uh, nothing like that. And, and, and this is perhaps why I always think that uh, we have to characterize it as not particularly liberal. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not particularly big hearted or anything like this. Um, it's closer to something fundamentalist, Puritan, something like this. And, uh, you know, this is sort of, I don't know, there's sort of different riffs one can do on this, but, uh, you know, if, if we think of uh, Elizabeth Warren as, you know, she is, uh, Harvard is still a, a Puritan divinity school like it was in the 17th century, and Harvard is a Puritan, uh, Warren is a Puritan minister from the less pleasant half of the 17th century. And it is, uh, she is like, she is a worse fire and brimstone preacher than, I mean, than the most retrograde Catholic or fundamentalist Protestant or, or anything like that. And, uh, and this is kind of uh, the, the balance that we, we need to somehow, somehow reset. It's, it doesn't lead to sort of a great political formula, but, uh, but, uh, but that's, that's, that's where things always feel, feel off to me. Um, you know, let me uh, sort of in, in a brief conclusion, you, there's, there is of course a way where, you know, these, these three themes, you know, the theme of economics, science and tech, and religion, I think are, are surely better than, uh, than, than just, uh, just the diversity uh, topics themselves. But if we, if, we have to, um, if we have to have a debate about diversity and political correctness, maybe we can at least just go back to what these, uh, the, the way, what these things originally meant. And uh, I always think the etymology of political correctness is somewhat instructive where, you know, by the 1980s, political correctness was a term the, uh, the conservatives, libertarians used to critique the intolerant parts of the left. In the 1970s, it was still something liberals described themselves as if they were, you know, really, uh, really doctrinaire liberals. But if we go back to the 1950s, the original meaning of political correctness was you were simply a card-carrying member of the Communist Party and you were following orders directly from Moscow. And I sort of wonder you know, if, if one should always think that this, this original meaning um, is still somehow very present, that it's the, you know, we should stress the totalitarianism, not the relativism. We should stress the nastiness, not the fake niceness. And we should, um, and uh, you know, the, the ways in which you know, it, it can only culminate in madness and murder and you know, this is a simplification. Um, I think we should be thinking about other things than DEI, but if you have to think about DEI, every time you hear DEI, you should just think CCP. Thank you very much. <laughs>Okay, why don't we uh, uh, get started with our fireside chat uh, session. And I wanna start by thanking Peter for this wonderfully rich talk. Um, I heard more interesting ideas, I think, in those 35 minutes than I've heard in, in many a Harvard lecture. So, so thank you for that. Um, and I'd, I wanna start with maybe one thought for you and one question, and then uh, your reactions can, can spur the further conversation. The thought for you is about um, wokeness as a distraction. I think there are undeniably cases where we can prove that to be true. So the journalist Li Fang has done this very interesting work on how corporations quite self-consciously have used wokeness to defeat unionization drives by um, pitting employees against each other on dimensions of race and gender and ideology and so forth. It's quite a deliberate tactic. So I think it undoubtedly occurs in, in, in your other examples as well. But I wanted to also suggest a different 
um, not necessarily inconsistent framework for thinking about wokeness, which is not that it's a distraction the way a magician distracts you from what's happening in the foreground, but a medical analogy that wokeness is a symptom. So wokeness is, on this view would be a symptom of some underlying condition. Um, so it's, it's not the main thing that needs to be addressed or cured. But symptoms are important. They're important in themselves. They have diagnostic value. Um, and if the symptom is left unaddressed, it can independently inflict harms on the patient. So if we have some underlying condition that creates a dangerous fever, the fever is a problem in itself apart from the condition. So while we're treating the condition with medicine or surgery, we might also very much want to address the symptom and we need literal or metaphorical aspirin for the body politic. Um, so I would see the activism of people like Christopher Rufo as a kind of uh, aspirin for the body politic and say that they, it's not that they've been um, caught up in a distraction, it's that they are doing perhaps not the main task, but an invaluable task um, that, that needs doing. So that was one thought about a slightly different frame for thinking about wokeness. The question for you, um, I would put, is something like this. It seems to me that um, decadence is close to the core of your thinking, that in some way this sense that uh, the stagnation of our economic and political order is very much at the core of what you care about. There have always been two, I think, very different critiques of decadence um, in our tradition, however, well before you get to Ross, doubt that. Um, I think of the Republican critique of decadence running from uh, Salas to Montesquieu, which says that the problem is opulence and luxury and the enervation that comes with opulence and luxury. And then there's another critique of decadence that I associate with people like Frank Knight and Joseph Schumpeter, which says that the problem with decadence is a kind of um, bureaucratization of the spirit. That is, that we lose the entrepreneurial spirit that created our very high civilization in the first place in some way. And what's interesting to me about your thinking, Peter, is I see strands of both of these critiques. Um, in different ways uh, in what you say, um, they, they seem to have somewhat different implications for capitalism or at least for unbridled capitalism. So I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on any of that. Well, I'm, um, well, to the extent that it's economic, it's not all economics, uh, I, I try to make clear, but to the extent it's economic, I, I, I'm still in the anti-socialist, free market direction, I'm still um, much more in the second camp. And so, yeah, there's this, there's this moralistic <laughs> argument that the, uh, the young people, the Gen Z people, um, have it too easy, and that's why they're not working hard enough. And uh, my intuition is that, no, it's actually, it's actually too hard. And that's, that's the thing that's demotivating. And it's, it's not about present circumstances. It's always about your, your view of the future. And if you, if you think that you know, hard work uh, an effort is going to translate into a, a much better future, that's, uh, that's, that's highly motivational. And if you think that's not, it's demotivational. And maybe you should be working harder if you're in a tougher circumstance. I don't think that's how it works empirically. If you think of it in terms of tax law, tax policy, the question is do income effects or substitution effects dominate? Income effect is uh, you're making $150,000 a year, you pay a third in taxes, you got $100,000 after tax income. We, double, we make the tax rate 50%. You work harder to get to the same after-tax income. And this was sort of the Obama administration theory that, that the more you tax the rich people, the harder they will work. Um, and that's income effects dominate. And so in theory, if people were rational actors, those would dominate. Um, what empirically happens is substitution effects dominate. And when things get tougher, people actually substitute leisure for work. So, so that, as far as the economics go, you know, I would come down pretty, pretty squarely on the the, uh, the capitalist side, and the problem is that, you know, things are too bureaucratized. There's people are too much caught in this iron cage of sorts, and uh, it's it's uh, too hard to to move out of it. But if if I had to, you know, if I had to sort of offer a, you know a critique of both of our our positions in some way is 
um, and of Curtis and Yarvin and all these other sort of characters that have been produced in the last uh, uh, decade as, you know, as the system is, 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 is rattling to an, to an end, um, is uh, I think we are very powerful in our critiques. And I think the critiques are basically correct, that you know, we, are, you know, we are at the end of liberalism, we're at the end of some sort of end of capitalism, end of science. Um, you know, and, you know, I always have this apocalyptic undercurrent where I wonder if this is the end of history. It's not a Hegel, Kojev, and Tropic Twilight, but it's literally the end of the world. Um, and, um, and then where we are weak is, you know, as philosophers of the future of, you know, what will the post-liberal world look like and what will future governance look like? And yeah, surely it will be different from the present. And uh, this is where I'm, you know, um, at least sympathetic to your position, at least it's gonna be so far outside the Overton window from what we currently have. And, you know, uh, and anything, you know, if, if you're still, I don't know, if you're still um, having this sort of, uh, you know, Jeb Bush versus Hillary Clinton debate, you are just, I mean, you're just rearranging the deck chairs in the Titanic or something like that. But, uh, you, know, I'm, you know, lifeboat's not that charismatic, you know, but, uh, but, uh, but surely, uh, you know, you should be making your way for the lifeboat or, or, or something, something like this. Uh, and then there's always this question of what, what does, you know, what does this, this future governance look like? And, uh, and then I think we always should be, you know, steel manning our opposition a little bit more. We should, we should be trying to figure out what are their strongest arguments. And, and what I kind of wonder is whether the liberals know all of this too. And they know that liberalism's days are numbered. And they know that there is, there is no succession there, um, after this that's possible. And so, uh, and uh, sort of my placeholder for what's, what's going on is uh, that liberalism, it's, it's sort of devolved into a gerontocracy. And we have this, and it's sort of devolved into this funeral. And this is sort of the, you think, sort of think of the Biden administration as this uh, living funeral or so, something like this. And it's, and then, um, but then, and then when you ask the question, what happens after? this funeral, um, it looks really bad. And so, uh, and so what we end up with is an endless funeral. And it's, it's just, we need more ceremony. We need to elongate the funeral. We need to m keep the funeral going as long as possible. And uh, because uh, we, we don't, act, the, the liberals actually deeply agree with you and, uh, and think that the system is bankrupt, it's finished. Um, they also don't really know what happens next. And, uh, and their placeholder is an endless funeral. And I think that's, you know, that seems kind of lame and uncharismatic, but, uh, but maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's better than thermonuclear war or the totalitarian state of the Antichrist or something. So those would be different, but, uh, but maybe an endless funeral is still preferable. That's great, that's super interesting. I mean, what you point out is that it feels as though we're in a strange in-between time where we have, new futures that we can imagine, hitherto unimaginable futures, and yet we also feel quite stuck in a kind of gerontocratic boomer liberalism regime that seems to go on indefinitely with no hope of being destabilized. Um, let me just try out for you two possible ways in which it could be destabilized. Um, one is I'm, I'm a believer in the, the sheer power of nature that is perhaps boomer liberalism can turn itself into a kind of immortal vampirism, but I'm not so convinced yet. I think maybe nature will catch up with it, um, although it's taking a shockingly long time. This is Adrian right, you know, saying, uh, yeah. sorry at lunch, that you know, we're, we're both way too young to yeah, really exactly. be part of this conversation. Yeah, yeah. To say, yeah, yeah. To say, to say yeah. nothing of the people in this room. Where, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. We have a system where it's, it's yeah. like, you know, if you're not 80 years old, we can't trust you. You're too high energy, and yeah, right. you might push the nuclear button or something. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And, um, right, and, so, right. and then, and then we, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, they're hoping that by the time you're yeah, 80, yeah. you'll be sort of co-opted into right. the vampire <laughs> liberalism. That's you, right. You won't, be like, you won't have the energy of an Ayatollah or something. <laughs> exactly. But the other way I think that there, and we were talking about this at lunch as well, the other way I think that there might be a destabilization of this kind of late liberal regime is the um, faltering character of American empire. That is, some of the um, foreign policy stuff and the stuff around the debt and de-dollarization seems to be shaking um, 
late liberal regime in fundamental ways that we haven't seen before. Um, and the, uh, you see strange symptoms of it, like the radical overcommitment, in my view, to, to Ukraine, um, the loss of control of literally of the Red Sea and Suez Canal, uh, replicating the British debacle of the 1950s. And these sort of things seem, I think, threatening to, um, to, to liberalism in a way that we haven't seen yet. So thoughts on that? Um, it, it, seems, um, it seems plausible. There's, there's, a, there's a way in which I always worry that this is still somehow too optimistic, you know? <laughs> and, um, and so, uh, but yes, yeah, certainly, um, certainly um, you know, the Suez Crisis 1956, if the British naval power did not extend to the far reaches of the Mediterranean, then the, you know, the empire was doomed, and you get Ghana's independence 1957, and by 1968, basically the, the empire unravels within a decade. So it turns out to be a signature moment, and I, I have the same question about the, uh, the um, seat, which seems to me sort of a um, slightly uh, misdirected Ukraine war, where, um, or very misdirected one, where um, if, if it turns out that American power cannot defend the periphery of Europe, then obviously, you know, Israel's in real trouble, and Taiwan is just simply doomed, and we shouldn't even be pre pretending that we're able to defend them, or, or something like that. Um, but then, you know, I, I don't know. It's 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 it is it is it, it's somewhat different from the British um, analogy because um, the, the the U.S. was a successor to Britain, and so there was some kind of very very rough handoff that happened, and uh, and this time it is again it's the end of the empire. You know, it's not like the end of the British Empire. Is it actually, is it like the end of the Roman Empire, where in a sense it is uh, pretty close to the end of the world? And there is, there is no, no real succession. And then, and then we get into all, you know, probably one way to concretize this is always to ask this question of China versus the US, just to, to reduce it to that, uh, um, to that uh, dipole. And I, I think there are, there are ways in which the US Empire thinking um, ten, has tended to be too complacent about China. It, it always uh, says China will collapse you know, under its own weight, and, uh, and we don't need to worry about it. Um, but then I also, uh, I also think that uh, a lot of the people who are hoping for the, um, an accelerated end to the American empire are too hopeful about China as an alternative, where uh, and, you know, they have a lot of problems, too. You know, it's, they seem to be incapable of reproducing. Um, there sort of are all these ways that uh, you know, something has gone very wrong with the G, and uh, the growth has probably stopped. There are all the, all these ways that uh, you know, and, and then of course we don't really know what's going on in China. It's it's, it's just it, you just end up. Yeah. It's, it's it's very very opaque, and so then we end up with just these ideological debates. But I think the you know the the non-accelerationist version would be that uh, um, China is in as much trouble as the U.S., albeit in very different in, in somewhat different ways, and. Um, it, it, it's, it's not really going to be a successor to the American empire, and therefore um, it is, uh, it's, it's going to be maybe a more elongated process. Good, well, the, the sense of the end of the world seems a good uh, time to start thinking about political theology. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and one of the things I love about uh, your thinking, Peter, is that um, on the economic side, you have uh, some libertarian instincts, as, as you said, but when it comes to discourse in the public sphere, you um, are interested in kind of openly entertaining arguments from political theology um, and Christianity, as you discussed in your speech, as ways we could think about our public life together. So I wanted to pursue that line a bit um, and ask you, um, uh, a bit about um, uh, heresy uh, and uh, liberalism as a heresy. So I guess my reactions as, um, from a Christian standpoint, and specifically in my case a Catholic standpoint, um, to your thoughts, was that um, yes, wokeness could be seen as in some way an offshoot of um, Judeo-Christianity, but all heresies are in some ways offshoots of Judeo-Christianity. And I think that the standard Catholic way, at least, to think about wokeness in this framework is that it's, it's a species of Pelagianism, that it's, it's the idea that by our collective efforts as uh, humankind, we can make a new Eden here on Earth. Um, 
and that history is progressing towards that um, culmination. Um, and so if it's, if it's just another version, if it's the latest version of an old heresy, um, my sense is that Christians can cheerfully agree with you and say, um, okay, what's the problem? We, we have understood that since, since the condemnation of, of Pelagius. The other bit I wanted to um, react to your, your very interesting discussion there was to say that um, I wonder if um, Puritanism is, is the right model for, for Liz Warren, <laughs> um, my, my former colleague Liz Warren. Um, I have a slightly different model, which is there's a very distinctive strand of liberal Protestant um, uh, liberal, liberal Protestant uh, theology that one sees in Boston in the late 19th and early 20th centuries um, that becomes um, immanentized and secularized into, I think, what is very much an ancestor of wokeness. So E.E. E. Cummings has a wonderful poem about the Cambridge ladies uh, knitting scarves for uh, the liberation of Poland or whatever it is, they don't really know. They're caught up in whatever the current thing is, but it very much has this sense of the imminentized eschaton that we're devoting all our energies to, this perpetual project of liberation. So if that's right, and if wokeness is really a descendant of liberal Protestantism and not Frankfurt School Marxism or not, any, not even Christianity generally, um, then maybe that's the problem. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, it's, um, you know, there are all these different threads one could focus on. I, I, yeah. I, would, I would think of it as more Calvinist, and yeah. uh, it's in some ways uh, harsher and more pessimistic as well, so it's, it's probably, I put more on the pre predestination thing that we can't change things versus too much free will, too much, too much agency. I would, uh, you know, there's obviously a way that Puritanism became Unitarian, yeah. In, in Massachusetts, so they, they were somehow linked. You ha but I, I, I don't know, the Puritan thing still strikes me as a, a somewhat useful prism. And you had all these subsects in the 17th century Puritans. You had the levelers who uh, wanted to level everything, and the ranters who were uh, ranting at people who um, uh, were too much in the hierarchy. And so yeah. I, I think there are these subsects that have, uh, uh, that I think have persisted uh, more, more than uh, we, we would think. Um, and then I think the, um, the, 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 the dimension I would though uh, come back to is it's always this question of, um, of uh, vi victimhood, injustice, overcoming injustice. And I think you know, somehow uh, Christianity is right to say that there was some dimension of that and then maybe where things get heretical is when uh, we say that, you know, it's always a question, can you be too Christian? And I think in theory, the answer is no. In practice, certainly yes. And uh, in practice, that was the Marcionite heresy, where you, know, um, you, know, you had to sort of, uh, you had to be um, more Christian than Paul, or more Christian than Christ. And then uh, it's Mar Marx is like this too, where Christianity will do things for the poor, but we need to accelerate it, and we need to have, um, we need to have the communist revolution. And so I, I, I think of, yeah, Marxism and wokeness is very adjacent, but. They were both this sort of uh, hyper Christianity, and we we needed to you know kill a lot of people and bring about a heaven in this world, and uh, it was it was sort of accelerationist, but in in this you know deeply uh, in this in terms of these values that were deeply shaped by by Christianity, it was not in the you know not in a retro pagan uh, classical way. That was that was always weaker, and this is this is always why you know something like. Communism is always what I think is the big difference between communism and fascism is, um, you know, they were all, you know, there's, they're in some ways they're doubles, they're similar, they just killed millions of people, but uh, fascism was always retro, and so you know the historical victims really were guilty, and then communism is we're going to go after the victimized, we're going to go after the bourgeoisie, the the aristocrats, the uh, you know all all these people, and we're going to victimize the victimizers, and that was sort of the hyper Christian, more Christian than than Christ move, and and, and so. The, you know, the nuance thing I would say on, on this is always, uh, you know, I, I don't think we should say there were no victims, but maybe what we, we, what we can say as Christians is that it's always a mistake when you say that you were a greater victim than Christ. Mm. And, um, and if, if, if people could always relativize their victimhood to that of Christ, we're still healthy 
and when you, when you, uh, when you absolutize it in some way, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's the dimension where this has gone, gone that, very haywire. That's super interesting. Hey, can I pursue it for one second? There's always been this deliberate paradox in Christian theology, and specifically Christology, which is about uh, so-called Christus victor, that is that um, Christ's suffering and condemnation and death is actually a form of victory. And it's how Christ becomes king over the whole universe. Um, and so I wonder how that part of it plays in into our thinking about it. That is, um, I don't think Christianity is just about weakness and suffering and victimhood and it's also about liberation from oppression, yes, but it's also about the restoration of a new order that um, brings with it a right relationship between authority, uh, humanity, and God. Um, and that part seems to have been lost. Yeah, uh, yeah or maybe, 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 the, maybe there's again some way that uh, the, yeah, you, you, the, the, the heresy or the hyper-Christianity, whatever you want to call it, has, has focused uh, too much on, on one sort of dimension. So yeah, the, the line I always have on this is, I have a preference for the Christianity of Constantine to that of Mother uh, Teresa. Uh, and then, you know, there's sort of all these ways you can say, Constantine was sort of a problematic figure, killed a lot of people and stuff, but, uh, but maybe Mother Teresa, maybe Christopher Hitchens was kind of right, she was a little bit too much mm -hmm. of a hypocrite or was too, too high a standard and you, right. you need to find, uh, you need to find some kind of a, some kind of a balance. But I, I, um, I, I don't know. I think I think there is um, the the I don't know the paradoxical thing is that somehow you know uh, it, it is it is by um, you know it is by 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 being a victim that somehow the I don't know the, the empire of Satan gets deconstructed mm. and gets exposed and and starts to unravel and and that's mm. you know it's always Christ as a king you know and the the, the, yeah. the Rene Girard observation anthropologically is it. Yeah. If every if every god in archaic cultures, if every if every king was a sort of living god, can't we ask the opposite question? And say that every um, every god is a dead or murdered king, and and so uh, you know if, if if we have a return of the king, uh, it's in some ways um, in some ways you have to you have to um, you have to come to terms with that history, and somehow will will involve uh, will involve both of those dimensions. I think. Wonderful. Um, so good. So that leads me to another thread I wanted to get uh, Peter's uh, thoughts about. Um, so the uh, mention of Constantinianism and the return of the king, I think, uh, turns our minds to a question that, that's much on the minds of the conservative movement now, which is our relationship to authority and state power. And we heard this in the panels before lunch, conservatives rethinking our views about um, the state um, as an enemy or threat uh, and rethinking that into the state as a possible uh, place for the restoration of, um, of right order um, somehow defined. Do you have general thoughts about um, the relationship of um, conservatism, libertarianism to the state um, and in particular the thought that <clears throat> the state could be seen as an opportunity rather than as an enemy. Well, it, 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 it surely is a, is a hybrid of, 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 of those two. Um, uh, you know, I probably still have a lot of learned helplessness where I, um, you know, I, I used to, you know, I'm, I'm not like a completely unreconstructed libertarian, but I, you know, a decade ago I always said I, was, I, I called myself a libertarian for a good reason and a bad reason, and the, the good reason was that I, you know, believed in a lot of the um, classical liberal ideas of limited government, government, individual rights, and things of that sort. And then the uh, the bad reason was that uh, I, when I said I was a libertarian, I was signaling to people that I was going to be a loser, and that uh, I was never actually going to get yeah. power. And yeah. uh, and then um, it, was, it was always, and that's why being a libertarian is sort of a politically correct way to be a Republican. Like Republicans might, might actually win an election. We can debate whether or not that matters, but, uh, but uh, libertarians aren't even gonna win an election. And so um, uh, it's sort of a way to, uh, to try to uh, be left alone a little bit more. Um, but, uh, but I don't know, it, it's, 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 it's probably, um, you know, in some ways uh, it, it goes back to this question of, you know, what is the nature of the empire? 
And, uh, and if we go back to the, uh, you know, the, the, and this was sort of a reg, re, re, really an original, you know, Christian um, a debate in the, in the days of the Roman Empire. Was it, you know, is it, is it sort of like G.K. Chesterton where um, the empire is something providential, ordained by God, and the Roman Empire was a good way to spread the gospel or, or something like this. And then there is, um, you know, there is, there is the, uh, the other version of it where, uh, you know, Christ's temptation in the desert, he sees uh, Satan tempts him with all the kingdoms of the world. And so in some sense, the temptation only works if um, the kingdoms of the world, and especially the empire, is uh, fundamentally, um, you know, not really divinely ordained, is more on the uh, satanic side. And this is sort of, uh, you know, Nero as a, uh, as a sort right, of proto-antichrist right. figure. Yeah. And I'm probably, you know, I'm probably still uh, cut a little bit more on the problematic mm. nature of the empire that uh, it is, uh, it is, uh, it's always like, you know, a little bit more corrupt than evil. It's like the Lord's Prayer, the first line, uh, um, you know, uh, or, or um, you know, thy kingdom, uh, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is a daily reminder that God's will is always done on heaven and rarely on earth. And mm. it's, it's sort of a limitation on the goal of empire. Or, um, when Christ says that he is the son of God, it's, you know, in some sense, we can go into Trinitarian metaphysics, but it is, it is a, the political theolo theology claim is, is, um, is that Caesar Augustus, the son of the divine, divinized Caesar, is not the son of God, and the Roman Empire is not ordainly, um, divinely ordained, and the government's, you know, not, not simply divine. And uh, this is where, you know, it's a sort of a complicated term, but, uh, you know, Rene Girard liked to say that uh, Christ was, you know, in some sense, the first political atheist, and maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, you know, uh, maybe a certain amount of political atheism um, is still a healthy corrective to the woke madness. Good. <laughs> As Peter indicated, I just want to make sure people understand there's a whole other tradition uh, in the Church Fathers of seeing both the Roman Empire and, and the Holy Roman Empire as precisely the catacomb that holds back um, the, uh, the end times and Antichrist. So um, there's very much a uh, another side to that story, but I, I take I take your point. Do do you then also worry? But, but you, you know, oh, you're, yeah. you're, you're you're never supposed to, you know, if you you, you talked about you yeah. know we shouldn't immunitize the eschaton yeah, no, line, yeah, yeah, yeah. but then I think there's yeah. also we shouldn't immunitize the catacomb either. Okay. Oh, yeah, and it's yeah. it's a very slippery concept, yeah. and it's always changing. And then there's always a way where you know the antichrist you know, comes by pretending to be the catacomb. So it's Nero uh, is an, uh, yeah, Claudius uh, is the catacomb, yeah. Nero is the, um, the bad emperor, or, you know, there's some way that maybe Charlemagne is a good catacomb, but yeah. then by the time you get to Napoleon, it's somehow, um, yeah. it's somehow a parallel to Charlemagne, but, yeah. but you know, the, the, the opposite. Or, or the more, you know, the more recent version of the Holy Roman Empire was Christian democracy in yeah. uh, Western yeah. Europe, where it was, it was catacontic, we're stopping communism, it, it was, it was also parallel to the Roman Empire. You know, it's like, it's a new and improved Holy Roman Empire. It's Christian, not just holy, and it's a democracy, not just an empire. And then, um, and it was catacontic for a long time. And yeah. at this point, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's probably, I don't know, the, um, the sort of uh, bad AI that um, makes all the decisions in Brussels doesn't <laughs> quite, uh, it seems like a catacomb that sort of um, passed its sell-by date. <laughs> Good. This is very interesting, and uh, and this brings me to a another topic. Um, do you see uh, Brussels? Um, do you see wokeness as a distortion of um, post World War II liberalism, or as a fulfillment of it? So you, I thought in your talk you seemed to see it as a distortion. Um, and I wanted to hear more about that. What what is the distortion, and how does it work? Oh, it's it's it's, it's sure, surely it's both. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I, look, I'm I'm very yeah. sympathetic to all your arguments that you know yeah. you have to go back a long ways, and there are these mistakes that have built up. Yeah, I want to hear what you think. You know, <laughs> a, a, a long time. Yeah. Yeah. But then, um, um, I don't know. There's there's always you know there there is always a uh, look. There's there's always a version. My 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 simple version of this is always that. Uh, uh, you know, um, when, I, when I was in college, we still had, um, you know, genuinely Marxist professors at Stanford, and they, they were people, you know, who said that true Marxism has never been tried. And uh, they're, they're the people who are, there are all these people today who say that true liberalism has never been tried, and I think they're roughly in the, 
it, they're somehow making that same kind of a category yeah. mistake that it, it's been yeah. tried many times and yeah. it, 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 it leads to something like wokeness and it, yeah. it's, it's not necessary and then there yeah. may be ways it could have been different but there's a certain tendency that, that this, this is seemingly what, what happens and, and these things need to be, be fundamentally rethought. And then at the same time, it's obviously like there is some decay. It's a very, mm -hmm. you know, it's a very de degenerate form of it. You know, where yeah. it, 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 and it has to, it has to turn into something somewhat different. You know, it's, I, I, I don't know, you know, maybe this is, this is probably not quite accurate, but um, my, my impression is there was some point in the past when the people who called themselves liberals were still interested in debate uh -huh. and still in the exchange of ideas. And there's some point where, where that changed. And that's, that seems like a very big change from, from, uh, from liberalism. And then obviously, maybe that was just uh, a, a natural thing to happen when your ideas were uh, wrong and you didn't want to change them. <laughs> right, right. right. I mean, ironically, um, I, I don't know if you followed this uh, episode at Stanford Law School with the federal judge who came to speak and was effectively shouted down. Um, and what I found ironic about that episode is the students who did the shouting down were themselves appealing to the idea of free speech in a certain way. They were saying that the hegemonic power over discourse of uh, their, this imaginary conservative establishment that they take themselves to be battling is, is the oppressor. Um, and, and this is, um, this is what I find very striking about wokeness is it, it seems to me to just um, Chris, uh, take to an extreme the idea of liberation from human bondage that is in some way liberation from oppression, liberation from um, overwhelming power, um, that it is in some way at the core of historical liberalism. It's at the core of John Stuart Mill um, and his successors. Um, and uh, if that's right, then the intellectual genealogy w would impeach liberalism too and not be a distortion of it. Yeah. Yeah, but I, again, I would, I, would, I would just, you know, yeah. I, I would just think we can, we can get at this much more basically. And I, I, again, yeah. I would just, I, I, I would still always make a little bit more of an economic argument. Mm. It's just like the rents are too high. And, yeah. um, you know, these, um, I don't know if you're, if, you're, if you're a member of the Harvard faculty, can you afford to buy a single family house? in Cambridge <laughs> and then um, you know are I'm there, looking over at my wife over are here. there all these <laughs> yeah. are there all the uh, and then, yeah. you know, if, if you can yeah, we yeah. should be investigating you maybe or something like yeah. this but, <laughs> right, uh, right. yeah and then uh, it's it's just very and then you know so I I, I know it's very it's yeah you know, it's part racket it's part uh, it's part uh, you have a lot of useful idiots and you have some true yeah. believers and it's this weird mishmash coalition of all these things but uh, but uh, I I come back to it, it's, 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 surprise, it's surprising how bad the racket has worked, mm. how badly the yeah. racket has worked, uh, even for, um, you know, I, I have, you know, you're, you're sort of a weird exception to this, but I have, you know, I always thought that academia discriminated against uh, conservatives, and I think um, the class it really discriminated against were conservatives who got their, baby boomer conservatives who got their PhDs in the 70s, couldn't get tenure right, right. in the 1980s. By the top, by our generation, um, most of the conservatives knew that there would be no jobs for them in academia, right. and the people who went into it were uh, were liberals, and they were they thought you know they would get a, a a cushy tenured job if they just towed the party line, and in some sense um, the effect of discrimination was more against um, the liberals who yes. wasted their lives yes. trying to get into this uh, yes. impossible system than the, <clears throat> than the conservatives. So if we right. you know if we it's all like somewhat somewhat complicated how, how it works, good, you know? Good, good. Okay, so let's bring it down to maybe some more uh, concrete stuff um, just before we have to, to wrap up. So um, policy questions, you know, surrounding uh, economics and real estate. Do you think that um, the system is now too ossified or are there, are there policy um, solutions you would favor if we could magic, magic away the political constraints. So you get, you know, three pieces of legislation that get to pass Congress. Um, is there anything we can do about it? Uh, you know, it, it seems very ossified. It, it also seems, um, it's, it, in, it, it seems like there are, there are, there, there should be ways around it that are, that are not, you know, that are not simply political. Um, 
you know, there was the, the, the Georgia real estate stuff got traction in the late 19th century because there was a way in which the frontier was closing. You used to be able to get, you know, 140 acres of land, the land ran out, and then basically uh, people had to stay in the big cities on the East Coast. The cities were um, um, these nexus, nexi or nexus, nexus, nexuses of inequality. And, um, and, uh, and then you got the progressive politics. The, the Georgist analysis, you get progressive politics as a result of the closing of the frontier. And then the 20th century, there was a you know, one-time relief valve, and it was in the form of the automobile, the highway system, and you built out the suburbs, and, um, and that sort of relieved the pressure. And then by the 1970s, 1980s, the highways are sort of a completed form. You, know, you, you can't move further and further out into the suburbs. And, and we somehow have this return of the cities in the last 40 years, and uh, the return of these, uh, you know, these, these very uh, intensely felt forms of inequality. So, so one question is, you know, the question I would have is, is there a way to blow up the cities? Mm. Would be the, mm. um, and uh, and metaphorically, you know, economically. Well, yeah. let's say, <laughs> yeah, let's sort, say of, let's, let's, sort of, yeah, yeah economically. Yeah, you know, yeah, right. yeah. Or, you know, we're not talking about neutron bombing them or something. I just don't, but, uh, I don't know if but, we're bugged in here, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, it, it was um, in the, uh, and, you know, I think the jury's out. It maybe doesn't look quite as good as it did two years ago, but there was, there was ob the, a, a technology hmm. way this might happen is through remote work and the Internet, because this is still, you know, it's still, the U.S. is still a vast country. It is not, you know, it is not insanely overpopulated. Mm, and there, right, there is, right. you know, there are a lot of places people could move, and I, I sort of wonder if, the, you know, if they can just do that, and it's, it's actually, uh, it's, it's, we don't need to figure out ways to change the zoning laws in, in Cambridge. We need to just, uh, you know, deprogram people from the Stockholm Syndrome they're suffering in, where they can't imagine <laughs> living anywhere else or something like that. So it may, it, it, yeah, the, 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 framing it as a legislation thing seems like a high bar. We don't always need to do that. Sometimes we just need to get people to think for themselves, which might be easier or harder. <laughs> Wonderful, Peter. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, Thanks appreciate so much. it. Yeah, yeah.